So with that, I want to uh, thank Beacon uh, again for the uh, real opportunity to engage in this conversation um, and to uh, have this discussion and uh, very fortunate to be able to work with uh, with Dr. Birlin on a lot of these things and, and uh, learn from him as well um, and especially uh, learn from you all as well. So we're hoping to uh, get some uh, feedback about what, uh, you know, what you all think, what your thoughts on uh, smoking and bladder cancer are. We can definitely address uh, some of these great questions that have come in, um, mm -hmm. but uh, thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. This has been a phenomenal presentation. It was really informative, and I, I think that I'm very excited that you guys are so involved in doing this, and I really do hope that you know, Beacon will be able to help you to get the word out to raise awareness about this additional threat about bladder cancer that comes from smoking. Uh, in some of the research, did you get a chance to look at any of the uh, risk factors about the secondhand smoke? That was one of the questions that came in. Um, you know, is that anything that you could comment on based on, you know, what you know off the top of your head? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a great question, and I think that is actually critical um, because this this happens all the time. We we see people in the office, uh, and they're you know they're ve they're very upset to be told uh, that tobacco may have played a role in all of this, and and they have never smoked, but they do report that they grew up in a household with heavy smokers. They currently live with heavy smokers, so I think that this is a most certainly uh, a risk factor. The issue is that it's very difficult to kind of quantify and really um, nail down just how much secondhand smoke is really inhaled and how much is really uh, exposed to certain people. So the difficulty in studying it has probably led to it being not as well appreciated. Um, but I think just understanding that you know exposure to smoke, breathing this in will eventually get these carcinogens into the urine uh, that it most certainly has a similar mechanism, a similar means of uh, of of um, of causing cancer, and this is why you know I think it is so important to really have um, you know these public policies and these very important uh, um, population level uh, ways to address smoking because smoking is not uh, does not only harm the smoker; it definitely does harm the folks around them. Uh, especially younger people um, in, in households that, that are smoking or in, in small confined spaces, airplanes, restaurants, all of these things that, that we've actually made good strides on uh, in, in preventing smoking from being more of a public health problem. Mm -hmm. And then also what about the whole issue about vaping in public spaces, obviously, but what about somebody who does it at home? You know, I have relatives that have quit smoking because they've switched to vaping. Not that that's the best thing to do, but they're um, vaping around their family members, including small children. So what about that impact? Is there any knowledge about what that impact of the fumes that come from vapors and, and you know all these other things that are in the air, including the flavorings and everything else, getting into the lungs and then the bloodstream of innocent bystanders? Yeah, that's a spot on question that you ask. And the reason being is because we are actually studying exactly that forthcoming. We are looking at the urine of patients who vape, and then we're actually looking at the urine of people who get secondhand exposure to the vape aerosols. Because right now we don't know, we, we truly don't know what that exposure is going to be and how much of those compounds that we described are processed and end up in the urine, but that is forthcoming mm -hmm. grant funded work that we have looking at the levels of those different carcinogens in conventional smokers versus e-cigarette users versus secondhand smokers versus never exposed smokers. And we'll have some idea of how much of that is actually transported into the bladder and what are those levels, but great question and truly it's not yet known. Excellent. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm glad because that was definitely a concern because I know all these people are saying, well, I'm a vapor, so it doesn't bother anybody, but it does bother them and it may have some potential harm beyond that. So you also mentioned earlier, you know, talking about many attempts to quit. It takes sometimes 30 attempts to actually successfully stick it and actually be able to walk away from an addiction to 
the nicotine that comes in tobacco. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe how each attempt is an opportunity as well to kind of learn about something about your triggers, about ways that you were successful, even for a short period of time? You know, what, what do you recommend uh, saying to somebody who is attempting to quit and then feels kind of a sense of failure if they don't succeed the first time? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's another great point in, in that, uh, you know, each each uh, quit opportunity is both an opportunity to quit, obviously, and also an opportunity to learn uh, about what is really preventing the patient patient from quitting. Uh, and I think this is one of those things that you really need to get to the root of and why the behavioral therapy and counseling and really being able to have the sounding board and being able to talk to someone, it really is is an integral component of all of this. Uh, because, you know, if, if it's that there are other issues at play that are really preventing you from quitting because um, of uh, social life or a certain job or something along those lines, obviously some of those issues are, are, you know, very difficult to control on the outside. But it's really about optimizing each attempt uh, as much as possible with the things you can control. Um, and I think that's where some of the, um, you know, medications come into play also because, you know, if you are in a situation that's totally unavoidable uh, to trigger a craving, that's really where you need the gums or the sprays or something like that. And that's, mm -hmm. and that's really where I think that, um, you know, really understanding that uh, comes into play. Um, you know, the, the, the other thing, too, is, is that it, it's very difficult to be introspective sometimes, uh, you know, especially with, with folks that are going through a lot with a with a cancer diagnosis or other health problems uh, related to tobacco use, that's really why it's it's very helpful to have someone else to kind of uh, help you reflect on what's going on, uh, because you know people have a lot that they're that they're dealing with. There's most certainly no shame in asking for help, and in fact, uh, you know we encourage it, and and we really think it's an important part of of getting over this hurdle and, and quitting smoking. So I think that that's why that uh, is is so important. So that's a really good point. So, you know, there are a lot of people who are caregivers who really care about their loved one who's been diagnosed with bladder cancer. What are your thoughts or suggestions for those caregivers? Maybe they've been trying for years to get their loved one to quit. And now that they have a bladder cancer diagnosis, what is your recommendation for how they can support the quit efforts knowing that it's not necessarily going to be successful the first time. What do you suggest, you know, we can offer to those caregivers that are trying their best to, I keep telling him to quit. I, I keep telling him that smoking is going to be the death of him. How do you, you know, encourage them to keep up supporting that loved one um, in their attempts without pushing them back to smoking, I guess, is one way to think of it. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, uh, you know, mindset is a lot. Um, and I think, you know, understanding that this is part of your treatment will really help uh, get everyone on board and get everyone on the same page. And, you know, as I, as I mentioned, that really quitting smoking is probably the most effective way of treating your bladder cancer. You know, there's no chemotherapy, there's no surgery, there's no radiation, there's no pill. Um, that will have the same effect on your long-term outcomes when it comes to your general health and your bladder cancer as quitting smoking. So, you know, understanding, and, and this is where I think the urologist comes into play as well, understanding that this is part of your treatment plan. This is not necessarily something that, you know, is, is going to be the most palatable means of, of uh, you know, the most palatable thing you're going to deal with, but it's something that I think is essential to be integrated into how you proceed after your diagnosis. Um, and I think really having that support system, having uh, people around you kind of be on the same page and, and also, you know, uh, trying to avoid smoking themselves. If you're in a two smoker household with your partner or your caregiver or your caretaker, um, you know, it's, it's really gotta be a team effort because uh, as all cancer treatment is, it's so important to have uh, support and have that team around you. So I, I think that that's what I like to, to relate to people. Thank 
you, thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question that is a little bit related, but I don't know that you've done anything. You've gone and you as experts have done such a deep dive into this research. Have you seen anything about smokeless tobacco products like chewing tobacco? We know that that's got definite issues uh, and connections to cancers in the mouth, but what about the smokeless tobacco, the stuff that you just chew? Does that have any kind of impact? Have you seen anything that's related to bladder cancer? So I can probably touch base on this a little bit. The data is pretty limited on whether there's a direct link between smokeless tobacco and the development of bladder cancer. But one of the uh, attendees mentioned, you know, if there is a lower risk, could it be used as a tool for quitting? And I think the take home message is that Smokeless tobacco has a very strong link to oral cancer, pharyngeal cancer, esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And as a result, I think you would probably just be swapping out one risk for another. So I wouldn't advocate as picking up smokeless tobacco as an avenue to quit um, conventional cigarette smoking because it does have a number of risks involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think we're at time right now. So again, I would like to thank you both for sharing so much with us. We really look forward to a lot of the publications that you have been working on, and we will share those with our community as we, as we see them come out in the, the journals and everything. And we'd like to again, stop and just thank our Patient Insight webinar sponsors, Estella Seattle Genetics Partnership, Bristol-Myers Squibb, EMD, Serono and Pfizer Partnership, FairGene, Janssen Oncology, Genentech, Merck, and PhotoCure for their support of our webinar series.